Hey, venture if, capitalists, get ready. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if any one of you wants to have a billion dollars idea, let's <laughs> someone out there make Tinder for dogs. That was, that was like, I, I'm not kidding. That was my, that was my idea initially. Just okay. <laughs> you have the screen, you show a dog, and if the other dog barks, then it's a swipe. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome again to Biograft. This is the series where we plot out life scientists, highly interesting people on this show. And today here, I'm with my good buddy from YouTube, Clement Steinek. He's actually a YouTuber that I've met during my own YouTube journey. And he's about to start his um, first year of doing a PhD. So he's about to embark on a journey that is where I am now at halfway through. So he's about to start that, and I think that's very exciting. And I wanted to have him on the show and ask him why he actually decided to start a PhD. So, Clemens, welcome. Hi, Kevin. Finally. Finally. After one and half he, years, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But yeah, as you will probably experience and already have experienced, uh, doing a PhD is very busy. And then we're yeah. as crazy yeah. as combining it with some sort of YouTube channel. So. Um, what, what I'm really interested in, and I think a lot of my viewers also, and then the viewers on your channel will want to know also why you're doing YouTube and why you're starting a PhD, because if there's anything that they can draw from your channel is that you have, you have a high, high interest in anything biomedical. But why would you go into a PhD? Why do you want to do research? Okay, so I would actually first say why I want to go into research and science and then why I want to go into the PhD because I think it's all like quite a long journey so in the beginning I think it was when I was 16 17 when I really realized that I want to go into biomedical research um, I was in a summer program back then um, with roughly 50 other teenagers it was in Cambridge actually and okay. we had the first courses there. So it was basically having lectures uh, until afternoon and then having excursions and it was all a lot of fun. And the thing was there that was the first time when I also really got to know actual research, which is okay. like amazing because I think the things we learn in school are all quite outdated. So they have been found out 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. And to actually see what's going on was just the reason why I really wanted to join because there's a lot of amazing stuff going on. And True. there was also a reason why I then uh, went on and made a YouTube channel just to share that stuff with the world. And then, of course, I also really liked being around those people who are like-minded. Yeah, so, of course, of course, yeah. And that's the reason also why the university then became a perfect setting for all of this. I think it's just great if you uh, meet people like at the campus and you just exchange your ideas and you can just philosophize a bit and help a bit and everyone has a different angle. And that was then also the reason why I wanted to join the PhD in the end because yeah. I want to stay in academia and that's just fun, I think. Yeah, because, because you mentioned like um, having those, those philosophical things. The, the term yeah. PhD is actually doctor of philosophy. And it also applies to science, of course, but it's, it's related to having deep thoughts or really thinking through about a certain topic. And I think that includes, and I also have this sometimes with my lab mates or, or with uh, people outside of the lab or ex-colleagues in my case, that you, you tend to philosophize on a certain topic and yeah. you start to hypothesize, oh, what if this would work or this or that, and then try to put it in another con context, maybe in a global scheme or something. And, and those moments are typically with, with coffee, somewhere around the coffee machine sometimes. Um, and I think those moments are great to expand broader thinking. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if, if that's what you're aiming at, then definitely a PhD. If you're in the, the right lab with the right setting, the same like-minded people, then I think you're in for a treat. Um, and I, following I up on that, I, I think okay. that you will be in a good setting 
because let's mention this to the viewers, there's, it's not just any institute that you're going to do a PhD at. So you're going to be affiliated with uh, the Max Planck Institute. And people, anyone watching now, you should look that up because that is a very highly respected research institute globally. It's, I think, well, maybe you should know better than me. I think at least top 100, top 50, maybe top 10. I think it has actually a highest research output because yeah. it's actually a, a huge cluster of 80, 90 different institutes across Germany. Yeah. Uh, also in the US, I think, an institute. Yeah. But they, they, they are, do amazing work. Yeah, they are amazing. Yeah, high impact uh, publishing, nature, uh, cell science. I think yeah. a lot of it comes down in those yeah. journals. That's something any researcher dreams of. I will start. <laughs> I will start. No, I will continue to dream of that, but I think your chance of getting there might be a little, a little higher. Um, just for the record, Max Planck was a German physicist, no? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so anyone starting Biomed or something watching this, I think you will definitely come into contact with uh, Planck's constant. Yeah. And I actually <laughs> forgot the actual uh, number or the value. Probably you can help me as well or... <laughs> Actually, kind of embarrassing, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, either so, but uh, you, will, you will encounter it in, in physics if you have courses in physics. Because, um, yeah, uh, you mean you saw my last video also that not every course in biomed uh, has, yeah, actual physics integrated in, in one single uh, course. Maybe it's applied somewhere, spread around. Because let's face it, if you use a microscope, you should know that a certain magnification, yeah goes down with, uh, or, or if you use fluorophores force in uh, flow cytometry, you need to know what excitement is when that uh, the atoms like fall, or the electrons at least, they fall into a different uh, shell around the atom and then they emit light. So that's physics in action and it's also needed of course in, in biomedical science. So um, you're going to start your first year. Um, yeah. What will be the topic about? So. Is it kind of um, an extension of what you did in your master years? Um, did you start already maybe in your bachelor years? I mean, I know what you did in your uh, master years, but I'll let you explain it to the viewers yourself because you're the expert, of course. So uh, where did you come from in your masters? And how does it extend now to your research that you will do in your first year? Or do you still need to pick a side project? Or how does this work? Tell me. Okay, so... Right now for me, my laboratory has uh, several focuses. So they focus on epigenetics, meaning how DNA, for example, is modified and how that can influence the production of RNAs. Mm -hmm. um, so the activity of genes. And yeah. they're also working on cancer and also working on histone modifications. And for me personally, in the first year, I have to say right now, I don't know my main project yet we have still to discuss it but i have a list of side projects i'm going to start with and then depending on how that goes i will get my main project out of one of these uh, different side projects okay. so the highest priority right now for me has actually to complete what i've done in my master thesis so okay. it was a great introduction from you okay um, cool so this is in the field of cancer biology. So what's happening here is that certain mutations in a protein, which is called IDH, and IDH is part of the mitochondria, so the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag we powerhouse all of the cell. We all know that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, a, it's a very important protein uh, for maintaining the energy in, the, in your cell. And what okay. can happen here is that a mutation can occur in IDH, which then leads to the production of what we call an oncometabolite. So this is a toxic okay. substance okay. which then messes up with your DNA and messes up with different proteins. And that can then push the cell into becoming a cancer cell. Okay. So in my project, I was aiming to have a very controlled setting to really find out um, what's happening once this mutation occurs, meaning once we have this toxic substance, because okay. normally, you just have a healthy cell or you have a cancer cell, but in the cancer cell, the damage is already done. So yeah, this substance true. has been there for a long time. And just to see what's happening in cancer evolution in the short term, 
was or is the goal of this is this project okay cool so is it like you say that the gene is um, involved in maintaining the energy is it like a kind of atp sensing uh, genes or protein so not really it's part of the grape cycle the citric acid cycle ah, okay. so yeah, i was yeah, just yeah. the the main part of it, i was just saying that because i think it's it's just easier to understand just yeah okay yeah because healthy. you have like, like these um ampk or um uh, yeah, yeah yeah i mean these, these are like sensors also for like glucose or thing i think everything in metabolism like triggers down because you have the glycolic glycolytic yeah. pathway goes all the way down to the Krebs cycle of course um and and in cancer there's the warburg effect right where cancer cells become warburg uh, okay. yeah, sure. yeah highly yeah highly addicted to sugar like yeah uh, like cancer cells really drinking only coca-cola or something yeah they're, they're really egoistic cells that just want to have all the nutrients for themselves it's unbelievable actually <laughs> yeah, yeah true uh fyi to anyone watching check out his channel he has several videos also covering the topic on cancer and um yeah we're doing some promoting in the meanwhile also but we'll come to the part where you started youtube and go deeper into that later more in depth of course um but what i wanted to ask you now is that in your program do you have um so you're doing rotations now uh, and you will pick a project and that's highly related to the biology of course and um, the techniques that you will use like in my phd program there's a part where we can choose to develop some transferable skills and that includes communication uh, good presenting skills um, technical skills also that's also possible like for instance um, learning r for programming or anything yeah. but do you have already a, yeah i know i still have to start that and you're smiling because r is like that's programming and that's like something totally different something else i promote a lot on this channel is to start investing in bioinformatics for anyone starting in our yeah yeah do that, that yeah the future right? <laughs> that would definitely yeah. the future um and before the recording we were actually talking that uh, i'm now covering some rac data and yeah if you're new to that, you have to start from the bottom and start figuring out what it all means. And yeah. I have to share some uh, sources with Clemens here because he's always also going to use that. So we're yeah, digressing. Dealing some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> um, so the transferable skills, is there any mm -hmm. part in your PhD program that you know now already, oh, we have separate courses on that where we could like be trained to communicate our science or to have uh, a better balance with like composing teams or communicating you know all those transferable type of skills project management time management good writing skills um what's included in your program can you elaborate a bit on that so my program has quite a lot of different uh things they offer so for example of course you have leadership qualities yeah. how to learn yeah. to really engage with other people to plan a project then uh, we also have a focus on let's say more technical skills mm -hmm. so for example the last days i spent on illustrator how to do scientific figures yeah, yeah, yeah. just drawing stuff <laughs> just drawing stuff <laughs> just drawing stuff <laughs> and then uh, next week i also have an r course so oh, okay <laughs> yeah so i'm i'm having a great time here with zoom um so yeah they offer actually a lot of different things and uh i'm thinking because some things are more relevant to me personally some things are not very relevant of course but yeah if if you now uh try to think for yourself what you should do which kind of, of soft skills then i really think that you should think of two different sides of a coin let's say mm -hmm. one is the really rational side and the other side is the more artsy side yeah because okay. i really think that scientists have to be both today so for example so true. you have to learn how to analyze data you so have true. to make good figures you have to know how to uh, plan your experiments how to conduct them so that they are really proper experiments and then on the other hand you also have to learn how to write yeah and in that actually i think for small that for small the category of being artsy um yeah Create creativity and um yeah yeah of course yeah, yeah that's true 
and because that's all this is what I'm always hearing and, and also uh, I've had a scientific writing course last year okay. and we went in a small conference room drinking coffee all day and just <laughs> looked at great writers and there was for example Stephen Hawking and the thing about his texts were that we were able to understand them and okay. we are not physicists I actually I have no idea about uh, black holes or anything yeah, but he was yeah, yeah such a great writer that really someone with more or less a scientific background can really understand him. Okay. And that's, that's, a, that's an art form, I think. Yeah, so, that, that's true. There, there's multiple levels of, of communicating yeah. your science, of course, um, to your peers, which you do in the journals, and then you use jargon, highly technical. And then, yeah, yeah also, what, what you're actually practicing and you're doing great, according to my opinion, um, is with your YouTube channel. You're actually doing that. It's trying to make science simple enough for the general public to understand certain concepts and raise awareness about a certain biomedical field. Um, and it's definitely an art form because I tend to have that myself. If you're talking to like your grandma and you're using, term, <laughs> you're using terms like yeah. multi-resistant streptococcus, uh, stre uh, staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, then yeah, you just say the the, the hospital bacteria, <laughs> then they will understand, yeah. you know? The, yeah. So there's there's definitely, um, that's definitely challenging. Yeah. Uh, so that's communication very... skills and that's indeed. Um, how was that writing course? Did, did you, how do you apply that? Do you use certain things that you learned from that in your master mm -hmm. thesis writing or anything? Yeah, so what I'm trying to do right now is something which is completely the opposite to when I started writing scientific text in my bachelor's back then. Uh, in the beginning, you all want to sound a bit fancy, I guess. Yeah. So you want to have long sentences which are very precise yeah. with a lot of terms. But then, actually, I mean, it's a good first step, but then you have to reduce that again. You have to have an engaging text where people can actually read. So this uh, teacher we've had, he was actually really focusing on what can you leave out of your sentence yeah. so that it doesn't get a huge sentence where no one is able to understand anything. True. Uh, did, you, did he use a specific um, term for that? But not per se perhaps uh, in the sentence, but maybe on terms of things that you want to discuss and then maybe something is not that relevant and then you just throw it out. Because yeah. I had a course recently also on presenting skills and the guy who mentioned this, I think it was uh, from Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway. Okay, yeah. Uh, you, you were going to say the term? Uh, the term, so he was saying we have to get rid of academies. So it's like oh, a language okay, that, trying to sound yeah. academic, <laughs> but it's just inflated in the end. <laughs> yeah, okay. But then, then it's still something different that I'm, I'm mentioning. Um, what he said was actually from literature, English literature. I think it was from Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and the term was to kill all your darlings. Okay. So if you have like a fact that you say, oh, I still want this put in because it's, according to you, it's very interesting, but it disrupts the flow. Yeah, yeah. To get yeah. the message out. Yeah. So you're saying like, okay, yeah. Yeah, this is this detail, but it's important, but it really messes up the whole flow of the, the text that you've written, then you should kill your darling. You should yeah. keep it out. And, and that is something that uh, I'm going to be honest, I don't know if anyone ever will watch this or rewatch this that I work with <laughs> in the lab now, um, but my writing, my academic writing, or at least my, my scientific writing is not that good yet. I still have to practice because I also tend to make a lot of long sentences, try to cram yeah, anything it's... in there and try to cover any research article. And that's also a bit the reason why my, my literature review, uh, so you probably know from, from a couple of vlogs ago that I'm still, still now busy working on a literature review. <laughs> um, but now it's because I'm busy with the article uh, and yeah. a lot of other stuff. So I still need to go into version three or four or something with that. And oh, uh, it's God, because yeah. I still need to practice my writing. So yeah. it's a learning curve. And yeah, yeah. I'd say I didn't I did get that course that you had. I had the option, but then there's also a lot of other interesting courses. Like you mentioned, you had the leadership option as well. So that's a course that I'm following myself now. And that's also very interesting. Yeah, so uh, for now, I'm actually, I haven't booked this course, I have to be honest. 
I did some leadership course in the past and I had one course, which was actually quite funny. Uh, it was an entrepreneur, entrepreneurship course. Mm -hmm. That's the word. Yeah, yeah. And there we had to form a startup and then go through all these steps and then oh, nice. uh, present that in the end. Yeah, it was actually amazing. So, I mean, I had originally a different idea. So we got together with a bunch of people I, I didn't know. Uh, so we were, I think, four different people with different backgrounds. And we had to brainstorm in the beginning and then we had to decide and that also uh, really trains your leadership. Yeah. But I just want to promote my idea now, which is that I... <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay, venture if, capitalists, get ready. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if any one of you wants to have a billion dollars idea, let's <laughs> someone out there make Tinder for dogs. That was, that was like, I, I'm not kidding. That was my, that was my idea initially. Just okay. <laughs> you have the screen, you show a dog, and if the other dog barks, then it's a swipe. <laughs> I don't know why that, that idea that, didn't get accepted. <laughs> but it's actually not. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's <laughs> stupid, but if anyone wants to do it, I think people would buy that. <laughs> maybe because the barking is, is kind of random, no? <laughs> <laughs> then, random. then let's say an emotion sensor, uh, which senses the, the tail wiggling, something like that. <laughs> Well, well, I think it's creative. I think it's creative. <laughs> now, now you have, still have to convince those venture capitalists to yeah. invest some money in that. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so, so probably in that course, you also saw the, um, uh, how should I say, if you do a startup, you go through rounds of uh, bringing yeah. up capital. So you have to promote and yeah. then you get dilution of stocks and all these dynamics. Yeah, actually, in my master years, I had um, a separate course on that. It was called innovation management. And that was a course that I actually flunked in my second master's in the first term. And I had to retake it in the, the second term. Then I got way better marks because I was fully focused on that. And that was also, let's say, a trigger uh, for me to run up towards getting invested with stocks because I, I do a little bit of investing in yeah. pharma or biotech stocks. And before I actually got really interested in buying some stocks, because yeah, I mean, interested and being capable because you've worked long enough, so you have some yeah. money to invest. So maybe the second thing being the main reason that uh, I actually retook that course. I mean, I took the actual course that was still, still here in my cupboard, uh, in my uh, book rack. And I tried uh, to recapitulate all those uh, rounds and stuff. And there's, stuff in there uh, about income statements, cash flows, mm -hmm. these oh, yeah. corporate technical stuff things that you should consider when you invest money also. So that's also a run up towards being more invested in how a company works perhaps if you would go to industry. Yeah. So, and, and actually leaving with the word industry, picking up on our conversation is where we left off with the transferable skills, your PhD program, where, because I mentioned industry, where do you want to end up? Because my channel is a lot about which careers you can get. You're your yeah. first year PhD student. I already was in industry. I did a PhD now. I'm planning most likely to go back to industry, probably yeah. in a, a higher position uh, to do some more management, but still be close to science. You're in your first year. You're directly from a master program. Where do you see your future going? And if you have several options, feel welcome to share them. If you want to be a CEO of the dog company, for instance, that's okay. So I think our viewers will like to hear that from you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think so. I have to say I'm, I'm speaking of a person who's just joining the PhD program because... Yeah, yeah. But I you must already have a sense of idea, a sense of yeah. idea, probably. Yeah, so for me personally, as for now, I would really like to stick to academia. Um, so complete my PhD and then continue being in a research institute or being in a university. Because once again, I really love this uh, creative freedom you have and that you can yeah. adjust with a bunch of people who have all the same interests. It's just amazing, um, personally. Of course, there are also quite heavy drawbacks with staying in academia, as everyone knows. Yeah. Um, but for now, let's, let's see if the PhD will change that. But for now, I would really like to stay there and then spend the rest of my life 
in a lab somewhere, probably. Okay. So in essence, <laughs> we're talking now with junior professor Clement Steinek. <laughs> uh, yeah, you to professor, let's say. YouTube professor, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Gosh, no, no. <laughs> I don't take that though. Please no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who knows, who knows? Well, you, there's no reason why you can't teach both. Well, I don't know, no. Probably there is. I think there's a conflict of interest. I don't think you can teach the same course and then teach it at a university, for instance. I think that that's not feasible, but you are teaching on several different topics. I mean, it doesn't have to be related to your research. So I don't yeah, think okay. there's, there's a reason there, there's one guy now that I, that I mentioned it, uh, it's also relevant to what we talk about because we mentioned earlier that data science is becoming more important, uh, yeah. bioinformatics, uh, you should look him up too. This is free advertising for him as well. I, I don't <laughs> know him personally or anything. I just found his channel and it's very relevant. He's called the data professor. Um, okay. I think it's a guy. He speaks very good English, but I think he's located somewhere in Southeast Asia. And yeah. his most viewed video is how a biologist became a data scientist. So he's actually yeah. a professor in data science, but he has a background in uh, biology, and probably yeah. biomedical. And he actually learned all the stuff, the programming himself. Yeah. And he rescheduled, he reinvented himself. Yeah. So that's, he also teaches at a university. So that's what I mean. He does YouTube and he also teaches at university. So I think there's options to do that. So yeah, if you I think want to be a YouTube professor, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think at least as long, so you, you have to keep that kind of separate if you want to do YouTube videos and uh, doing your research. So for me, it's more like I read something, which I found is interesting, um, online, in a journal, for example, yeah. uh, it's an old video, but one time I was just reading about uh, curing type 1 diabetes through stem cells, yeah, uh, yeah. which is actually, there are some clinical trials right now. And at, as long as I don't really promote my own stuff, I think it's okay. And as long as I don't promote, let's say, pharmaceutical products or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's, that that's can also, yeah. get a bit messy, I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that, that's also something that... Um, I don't know if I think there's one video of mine where I sometimes it's something is so standard or you mean like a, a brand name that is so standard re related to the product that you just tend to uh, yeah. mention it like as such. Uh, and I'm thinking of, of yeah, maybe historical examples like uh, Kodak. Kodak was like the, the, the camera yeah. uh, film type of thing. Um, and I think there's one video where I almost mention a company because it's the standard in yeah. that essay and then i try to go back on my words um yeah. not to promote anything i stay neutral of course um so indeed if you would say anything about a specific pharmaceutical or something like that or a specific company if it's not for educational purposes then indeed you're yeah. you're, in, um, you're in trouble and, and um I, also I the also... thing with sorry I Go think ahead, also uni on university wise, just for yeah. uh, anyone who's watching, we actually had to sign contracts for, for our PhD where we have to state that we are not influenced or have received any gifts from yeah. any companies yeah, yeah, uh, that yeah. we, our research is independent. And if we now had, I think, a, like a sponsorship from a big pharmaceutical company, I think it would violate a contract. So that's really something. Yeah, because... Yeah. I, I imagine you already attended several conferences during your master's also that you had to attend for a course or something um, or, or not, not quite, but uh, in any case, yeah. if, you, if you will uh, attend conferences in your uh, specific field in the future, I think, um, how should I say this? You know that in the past, before I went into industry, I started a PhD uh, once before, started but couldn't finish and that's why I'm doing the second uh, round now. Um, so in those five years in between, now coming back to academia, there's this trend that is introduced um, where they have disclosures. So if people start a presentation at a conference, you see the title slide and you see the yeah. title of their, their research, their affiliation to the university, 
And then the trend now is to put up a slide with disclosures. They click on that, you see disclosures. I have nothing to disclose or I have this to disclose and there might be a full list, there might be three topics on that and they just, these are my disclosures and then they start immediately with like the slide so you don't have almost any time to yeah. read the disclosures. And, and it's like, okay, we're going to do this, but then again, it's like, yeah, yeah. you don't give time to read. And indeed, yeah, I can imagine um, there's more and more awareness of research that towards the general public, they always say that check your sources. So if the funding comes, for instance, from, yeah. let's say yeah. a pharmaceutical company, they of course want the drug to work. So, yeah. but that doesn't mean that it's always like that. If they put the yeah. money to test the drug, you should just take it into consideration, but it doesn't mean that if it does work, that it would be exaggerated then it would be rigged. I think it's still related to the integrity of the researcher, of course. Yeah. And maybe that's also a bit the reason why they don't take it that seriously on peer-to-peer, -peer, because that's what conferences are. Those are peer-to-peer -peer interactions where they don't uh, go into depth on that. So that, that's, that's a trend that I've noticed five years before. No one did that. Now every professor yeah. like, is doing that. Oh, I received grant money from this company to do this or that or to fly, yeah. just reimbursement to fly with the plane to a conference or, or anything like that. So yeah, um, that, that's one of the trends that I noticed. So you should watch out for that. Just uh, take, take care, uh, take note of that when you go to conferences. It's, it's yeah, funny, it's you, will remind, you, will be, you will be remembered about what I said now, so. Okay, I, I will look into that. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> so what I wanna dive into now is the reason why we met and that's your youtube channel of course so you have a youtube channel called life lab learner l3 in short um, yeah. how did you come up with the name i actually never asked you oh gosh uh you know i was actually thinking for quite a long time to launch a channel because of different reasons and then actually at that time i was in the uk i was mm -hmm. And uh, so living in a student accommodation there in, in, uh, at Imperial College. Mm -hmm. And that's not a joke, but I was actually having a dream of having that name. Because oh, I was thinking okay. that how could I name myself? And it was Life Lab. And then uh, somehow it just fit together. And I was like, oh, God, I have to write it down. And then some months later, or I think, na no, one and a half years later, I made a channel. Cool. So it was actually like, it, it sounds uh, weird, but it was, it was actually a dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, like, like an epiphany, like, and then was it like at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. And then you, because if you have a dream like that, usually you have a great idea. And if you don't write it down immediately, you wake yeah. up. And then you forget it. Yeah, yeah. I actually wrote it down. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. So cool. <laughs> and I mean, the, the name the name doesn't sound so smart. So life lab learner, okay? Why but it does. It does. I, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's a bit catchy. But oh, okay, that, that that's cool. I mean, for the purpose, yeah, it should be attractive to the general public, no? Yeah. Somehow it was just it was just the right name, and I just stick to it. Well, yeah. yeah. I I think I also did like. Oh, I mean, I, I think no one on my channel actually knows what the name means because a lot of people think that Biomed Master, that I am the master of, of this okay. channel uh, and that it refers to me. But the actual intention of my name was because I am a Biomed Master, Master Degree. Uh -huh. And I graduated on that level and now I'm <clears throat> doing the journey <clears throat> Sorry, towards a PhD. Uh -huh. um, the intention was actually to provide content so that people who get into the biomedical field also uh -huh. master it so that they have skills and resources I mean, to master smart, yeah. the field. And it, the name doesn't reflect to me, but somehow people tend to associate it uh, with, with me being the master. And I, I honestly am humble <laughs> and I do not consider myself the master. I think there's far better people uh, than me who could maybe do this, but that was the thing is that no one did it. No one on YouTube was yeah. promoting the biomedical field to yeah, get into it, yeah. to study. Yeah. And related to that was the bad rep 
that biomed had a bit being the trash can of medicine and that were no good. They were all just failed medicine students. Uh, and I wanted to get rid of that stigma and also the stigma that you cannot get into certain type of jobs because that's always the case. Do I do pharmacy? Do I do biotech? Mm -hmm. And I just want to make those youngsters a bit more comfortable in the sense that, okay, you have your biomed degree. There's options to study yeah. uh, further, to go into that field, uh, go into industry. It's not all just black and white. And you have more or less the same options sometimes if you also did, or if you had um, a colleague or someone who studied along in your years who has a pharmacy degree or yeah. a biotech degree. Yeah. So, and, and to nuance that a bit. And that was the whole intention of, of my channel to, to come up with that. But, and then, but still, if, of course, if you, if you make these channels, and yeah. then you bump into each other, then you get these awesome collaborations like we're doing now. So, yeah. <laughs> but but the, the question to you, so you also said that it's more about the journey of becoming a PhD student and, and yeah. then so on. Yeah. But for you personally, once you finish the PhD, will you rename yourself into biomed's <laughs> doctor? Uh, mm. I don't know that then I have to reprint t-shirts and stuff. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that's it. Yeah. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only one shirt. So, uh, if anyone's interested, the shirt, it's not for sale. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I was just thinking, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. You are, you are already having merch. <laughs> no, 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 no. I actually had a, a request for, from one, um, I think one of my loyalist fans, um, Alessandro, he's he will probably watch this again. I think I mentioned him. He's, he's very interactive him, on my, yeah, probably. Yeah. I think, Comment section. He, yeah, yeah, indeed. I think he's like 15 years old or 16 years old and also already highly interested in biomedical research, asking questions on how to become a CEO, uh, stuff yeah. like that. So, and he asked for a shirt. So Alessandro, you still have to wait. I don't have any merch yet. Um, or maybe I, I will never have it. I don't know. We'll see. About, I mean, but maybe, uh, maybe rename or repurpose a little bit. That might be feasible. Maybe it's, <laughs> why not? Um, but yeah, no name consideration for the coming two years. So hopefully I will graduate in somewhere in 2000, the end of 2021. And then oh. call me doctor, but not that kind of doctor, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's those t-shirts with that. You know those t-shirts? Which t-shirts? Not that kind of doctor. Yeah, I've, I think I've, I've heard or I've seen the t-shirts in graduations or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always a joke because, yeah, oh, I'm a doctor now, but you're a PhD. You're not a medical doctor. So yeah. <laughs> that's always the joke, right? Um, so picking further up on your your purpose with um, your channel, uh, what would be the, the direction that you're steering it in in the near future now? Hmm. Could you give some hints okay. on the upcoming videos that you're about to release? And how do you see it evolving in the long run? What, what do you want to accomplish with, uh, with your channel? Okay, so uh, right now I'm actually thinking quite a lot how I will do my, my content in the near future because I will also start my PhD. So there you do not have so much time sometimes, but you also have to stay <laughs> consistent. Sure. Yeah. And my types of videos actually take very long to do just the animations of stuff yeah. moving. Yeah. So yeah. if you see people like Kurzgesagt, for example, the channel, yeah. I think they have 30, 40, 50 employers working on videos yeah okay so it, it's actually yeah. it's huge work yeah. and so i also want to start to think what can i do where i talk more to the people also more on a personal level yeah. um do do some kind of stuff so i'm now planning a video for example in about what is life what is actually life how do mm -hmm. we define it mm -hmm. because it's actually also a very difficult question i mean we are all alive obviously mm -hmm but viruses are not considered to be alive. True, and yeah, true. I actually drew my uh, inspiration from a podcast with Paul Nurse. Uh, he got a Nobel Prize for the cell cycle, I think 15 years ago. Okay. And he just released a book, also What is Life? And this question has always 
fascinated biologists and physicists. And he actually had a quite interesting take, which was that viruses themselves are not alive. Mm -hmm. But once they enter the cell, they become this life-like form. So you could say that they are alive when they are inside cells and infect cells. Yeah. And it's actually yeah. a very interesting take. And he also has a, a huge focus on the biomedical, uh, sorry, on the uh, biochemical nature yeah. of molecules interacting with each other, enzymes. So, but I still have to figure out the precise video and do stuff like that. And then also, of course, I will continue making my old stuff. So next video yeah. Yeah. will be about jumping genes in your DNA, which can cause cancer, aka ah, cool. transposons. Yeah. yeah, transposons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah like sometimes you get these weird moments in university when you like really have a, a topic where you thought, oh gosh, I should have known that because it's so, I mean, it, it, it's so fundamental uh, and, and also so scary on the other hand in this case, uh, which is that in our DNA, a huge portion consists of, let's say, ancient viral particles. So yeah. a long, yeah. long time ago, viruses infected our DNA. Yeah. They stayed inside. Yeah. And now our cells actually use them. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they just become reactivated and then they jump around in the yeah. DNA. Yeah. And now happen if that happens in a, in a gene, which is very important for preventing cancer, then you can have Bad a luck. step towards cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and just, I, I just think it's funny, just uh, in my last video, I had this segment where just in your room, it's completely dark. Uh, you, you do not want UV lights to, to penetrate your skin because it causes cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And different foods can contribute towards cancer. And then even if you just stay inside your room, you have these kind of weird jumping things inside you, which can cause cancer. Yeah, it's true. Ba basically, just being alive is a risk factor for that. Yeah, right? yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the thing. I think cancer biology is also one, that, that was part of my first PhD project. When, once oh. I uh, did my initial thing, okay. we were working on um, PKB, protein kinase B, okay. or uh, AKT2, uh, the second isophore. And trying to um, yeah to generate nanobodies against that to see its um, yeah. molecular functions within breast cancer cells and prostate cancer cells. So okay. yeah, most commonly um, hormone related cancer cells. Um, but in general, I'm reading now in bits and pieces. Um, I think you know that I read this because I, I mentioned this also in one of my live streams. Um, the emperor of all maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Uh, it's the, the Bible of cancer. It's the, okay. the big book that everyone should oh. read who's in cancer yeah. biology. Uh, so I'm saying you should read it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. But I, I can't seem to get, yeah, consistently reading through it. But the parts that, that you read, it's like basically a novel about cancer with the scientific facts in there. And yeah. you all these anecdotes and um, yeah, like, um, historical stuff, writings about the first um, chemotherapy that was set up, uh -huh. how it was in the lab back in the 50s and how they came up with it. Yeah. And, and you had the, the atomic bomb being, um, being generated. And all the while, the biomedical research was a bit on hold because the war had to be funded and uh. how, how it all came together. And it's really well written also. Uh, it's, it's a highly recommended book, uh, Emperor of All Maladies uh, by Siddhartha Mukherjee. He's a, an oncologist, so he's a physician, and he actually works in the oncology field in hospitals and also does research. So um, yeah, cancer biology, definitely one of my, my favorite topics alongside immunology and uh, of tons of tons of other stuff, anything. Yeah. Because, yeah, probably you too would say anything biomedical. There's so much interesting stuff going on. That's something yeah. you always say. Uh, but if I have to pick certain topics, then it's uh, cancer biology, immunology, and then immunology related to the gut-liver axis. That's something my research is about. So I work on the gut and the liver and how they are yeah. interacted and how myeloid cells are uh, involved in that process and how can it go wrong in inflammatory bowel disease or in liver dysfunction like uh, chronic uh, liver diseases, mostly non-viral. We don't uh, cover the hepatitis type of stuff. Yeah. 
definitely not hepatitis B uh, because there's there's vaccines for that and the burden is decreasing. But what's increasing yeah. is the burden of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, obesity, and yeah, yeah. Uh, diabetes. Course, that's, yeah. that's increasing yeah. tremendously. Yeah. Uh, you probably yeah. know this, of course, because yeah. you're interested in so many topics. Um, and that will be a, a big factor for the future. Uh, yeah, people with increasing true. cardiac uh, problems, um, increasing metabolic problems, diabetes, and it's only increasing. And I think a lot of it has to do with how we eat, how we live, lifestyle. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, not always can people stop themselves. Maybe there's something wrong in their uh, leptin hormone signaling. That's one part. Another thing is the lifestyle. Sometimes it's not diff uh, not easy to put it out of the context. If the whole family is, for instance, eating not so healthy, you should readapt your your habits as a whole family. Yeah. Then, uh, I mean, there's there's more to it than just saying, okay, you should eat healthy, you should exercise more. Everyone knows you should do that. Yeah. But if you talk to the physicians that you come in contact with, or at least that I come in contact with at my university. People know that, but it's like people know they shouldn't smoke, but still people smoke, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not black and white. And that's why there's still an unmet medical need you should have because there's no therapeutic drugs to halt, for instance, the fibrosing liver of people who have obesity. So there's unmet medical needs. So you should, we should, as a society, still invest in developing drugs that could hold that yeah. and people realize, okay, I should reconsider my lifestyle, but maybe stop the damage up to that point. So, um, and that, that's my interest, my big interest, more or less. I'm not working on obesity. I'm actually on an autoimmune disease of the liver. I will sure cover this in a separate video in the near future somewhere, maybe do yeah. a collab with you on that uh, because it would be interesting. I think the format yeah. where I explain the biology of my topic would be interesting to feature on your channel, of course. Yeah. Um, but we'll see where that goes. Um, and then I think we haven't discussed, but in the long run, the purpose of your channel is also to inform the general public and not also, yeah. not only the, the people who are interested in science or a bit research minded, I think you want to get your message to people who just want to know about a certain disease or get more background in terms of if their family uh, would have a person yeah. in it who could develop cancer, that they have a bit more background, a bit more understanding of it all. That's also a bit of your purpose, right? Uh, yeah, that's true. Certainly in my first videos, uh, especially I was just picking apart different diseases so um, my first video actually was on uh, cardiovascular diseases. Yeah, 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 true. Now if I look Ad back into it. Atherosclerosis, no? Atherosclerosis. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, then later on in, in, in cancer and uh, also talking about diabetes. And I actually got quite a few comments, multiple sclerosis as well, where people comment, yeah, I know this and this person, this relative who has it, or this and this person. And... For me personally, I want to explain it so that people understand the disease, yeah. but I also really want to give therapeutic approaches to it in the end often. Yeah. Yeah. So for example, diabetes, how it might be cured in, let's say, the next 30, 40 years, long yeah. time span. But yeah, but the, everything is long time span in pharmaceutical development and research, right? So Yeah, yeah. So just that people know that scientists are actually working on that. I mean, yeah. I don't want to give false hope. Those yeah. are very dramatic cases. But then on the other hand, uh, there are many creative people working on this. And also if there's a person who is just interested, maybe this person will also be somehow influenced and think, okay, that's interesting to me. Yeah, of course. And yeah. that of course would be then the ultimate co goal to uh, get people really interested into this kind of research. Yeah. Like once again, because I really think there is many amazing stuff and uh, we don't really get stuff like that taught in school. So we learn yeah. what is the True. DNA. Of course, basics True. are important. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. But we don't uh, get to know how, for example, uh, the different bacteria in our gut influence different diseases in our yeah. brain and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And I think yeah. that we could get a lot of, 
people interested in biomedical research if we just yeah that's true because, because also it, it gives it gives us <clears throat> well us maybe then as a community of being science communicators um on youtube or on different other platforms if you would highlight a certain uh let, let's say that the politicians tend to put money on a certain disease but another disease becomes more relevant then maybe as a community you could say okay let's highlight this so that the general public knows more about this one this particular disease and then they would be inclined to vote for people that are going to make investments in that disease area so a bit yeah. of science policy that you could influence the opinion on science how it looks how it is invested uh, i think that would be the ultimate power if you're you're big enough and have enough influence of course uh, but i think this could be one of the consequences of, of doing stuff like this i mean also a very very difficult topic on the other hand if you think uh when when science and politics go together i mean of course you need funding on the one hand but yeah at yeah. least i'm just trying to to get as far away from politics as i can because i i just think that politics can really be very toxic for objective science so yeah, that, that's, ideology that's comes true. into place i mean that's true definitely yeah, definitely but, but in, in any case um in any case you're you're, you're linked to it because the money your pr yeah. gets for showing sure. your project yeah, that's the thing. has yeah. to apply for grants and then yeah. government people uh, um uh yeah install a certain panel and they have to yeah. decide where the money goes and a certain budget yeah. is, is related to that and there's more and more competition and that's also why academia is publish or perish um and yeah. there's so much pressure on on researchers nowadays uh, anyone doing a phd or, or in doing postdoc or who is in academia will verify this most likely if they're watching this um it's sink or swim right yeah. and you're, then you're competing with the, the very big fish um and the smaller labs then maybe tend to get cycled out and then maybe if you communicate your science well enough as being part from a small app yeah. then you could have public interest and then you display yeah. this to the grant application committee and then they say oh this guy is also doing efforts in making his research publicly available yeah. um, and that might benefit you for getting extra money or something i mean that that's yeah. where maybe the the science communication comes in with the science policy a bit that's on a smaller scale, of course, not completely steering a whole field. Yeah. Um, but in any case, yeah, politics is involved, whether you like it or not. But I, I, I understand that you want to distance yourself from this. Um, I, yeah, I'm not yeah. also, I'm not also personally yeah. heavily involved in yeah. stuff like that. But yeah, it, it is what it is. It's, it's yeah. there. But what I what I saw, so I now actually joined a political platform. I joined Twitter. <laughs> yeah yeah that's true that is so, a political platform such so, but just to make some bad science jokes but what <laughs> i'm seeing there is a lot of researchers have twitter i i yeah. didn't know that and yeah. they let's say promote at least their the latest work to their other peers yeah so maybe that could be a platform also in the future if people are, are interested yeah. in, in, in science to just to share it. Yeah. And also what I, I saw like in the last week, and, and this is something I think which might become very relevant, is that right now as scientists, we are, I mean, we are a community, but we are still, let's say with our issues, we all have the same issues, but we are quite isolated, let's say. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, for example, yeah. there's this like issue with working hours. So some people in the lab, have to be there from 8 to 10 p.m. six days a week or they will get into trouble with their PI. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. last week I really saw that, that in the UK a lot of scientists were connecting and say, hey, we should now appreciate, for example, the position of postdocs and during the COVID-19 pandemic so far, they have had the biggest troubles and uh, they should get raises or the salaries are really bad for them. Yeah. And I just think that this this might be uh, become more and more relevant on on social media. Yeah. So I don't yeah, know. I, I fully agree. I fully agree uh, because yeah, it's now Saturday, and after this, I'm also continuing working, right? So yeah. on my uh, my RNA seek data. Um, yeah. 
I, I tend to blame COVID now because um, in general, my, my working pressure is, is okay. And that's what I say a lot also on the channel is that it, it comes in waves. So if you're saying yeah. that you should be in the lab from six to 11, six days on, out of seven, um, that's, that sounds really harsh. But indeed, in some labs, that is the culture. And it also depends yeah. <clears throat> which yeah. lab you choose or which protocols, because some protocols might take all day to get from your tissue to your isolated cells and then do yeah. some analysis on that. So yeah, you need to, need to balance a bit both. My project typically, it, I say it comes in waves and now I blame COVID because my research paper should have been finished already if I hadn't had the pushback to the later yeah. date now of COVID and now everything comes together. The start of a new project, uh, finishing a review, uh, writing up the research paper, uh, guiding a thesis student. Um, there's there's oh. tons of stuff coming on. Yeah, I'm guiding a thesis student also. Master um, or bachelor? Uh, a master, a master student. Uh, she's doing great. If, by the way, if you're watching this, she might be watching I, this, I don't know. I, I just uh, want to ask, does she know that you are doing YouTube? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and another thing is that, like, like you mentioned Twitter, because uh, what I would do, like we just discussed, to put out your own research, Twitter can be a good platform to get yeah. more uh, reads of your article or something like that. Yeah. Maybe I would then feature maybe parts of my research that I can disclose. If it's, I don't know if we're going to publish open access or not. Uh, that's something uh -huh. I don't know yet. But related to that, I can talk about it and then maybe on your platform. And then I would not do it as Biomed Master, but then maybe just as, as me, myself, the researcher. Um, yeah. So that's something I'm considering also for the future. But um, do you have a separate Twitter account, a second one? Because no, you have Biomed no, Master. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Only, no, on Twitter, I don't have a separate uh, account. I have, I have a separate Facebook account or YouTube account, of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Twitter one I still have to make. Um, I have a research gate profile you probably have ah. that too no ah oh, not yet no i have to oh, not yet. that's if you're in yeah. academia and you will are planning to stay in academia i highly recommend to make a research game yeah. profile. um linkedin is also very interesting yeah uh, and that would be more for the uh industry part but if i have both so uh yeah. anyone watching it again i also have a video on that uh promoting to make profiles on that even if you're still a master student start listing your skills so that you can put yourself out there and increase your chances of getting a job somewhere. So, yeah. uh, but definitely the whole online thing, it's, it's fantastic, right? I mean, we meet, you're, you're now in, in Germany, several hundred kilometers further. I'm in Belgium, yeah. we have this interaction. I mean, I, I met already so many great people uh, doing this. Uh, people are thankful, you're, you're putting something out there. You're trying to do good as well. Uh, maybe inspire people to get into the field, inspire people to know more about certain disease fields that you're doing. I mean, the whole thing is great, but it takes time and excuse us for not being consistent with yeah. our videos because we we're sorry. still doing science, right, Clemens? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you saw the previous episode of this uh, format that I do this yeah. on my channel, you know that I want to install consistently if I do this with other people is the A or B question. Okay. Okay, so uh -huh. you, I'll give you two options and you have to okay. say which one and you have to motivate why. So option A, DNA. Option B, mm -hmm. RNA. Go. Okay, that's easy. DNA. Okay, and why? Yeah. Uh, I mean, RNA is great and RNA is much fun. But <laughs> everyone who works with DNA and RNA in the laboratory knows that RNA is quite unstable. Yes, yes, so exactly. I, I, that, that was the answer I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, no, because I mean, I, I'm working with RNA quite a lot as well. And I mean, it's okay. It, it is not so unstable, I think. But every yeah. time I always keep it on ice because room temperature just yeah, RNA doesn't like that, yeah, not yeah, at all. Yeah. And every time I just pipe at it or anything, I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, my poor sample is getting piped. <laughs> I suck it up. I don't know. It's just <laughs> with DNA, DNA is, is like, I don't know. With DNA, you cannot do anything wrong. Yeah, normally. it's robust. Yeah. That's true. It's, 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 I mean, but here, here's, here's a small twist. Here's my twist. RNA has splicing variants. Yeah, that's the thing. It's more fun on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it also... I don't know. I mean, huh. 
<laughs> now I made you doubt, so we're going into scientific discussion now. <laughs> yeah, it can also be problematic with both. So, uh, yeah, I mean, true. but then what about cDNA? So you can CDNA, yeah. If you may, if you go to qPCR, then you indeed make exact copies of the transcript. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes you transform it uh, RNA yeah. into DNA back, and that's also fun. Yeah. So that's called yeah, CDNA. That's true. That's true. So. Okay, so that 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 will be the final conclusion of of the R A and B question. Let's go for uh, CDNA. Yeah, and, and let's say that um, science is much more complicated than you think, and there are pros and cons <laughs> arguments for everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good one to to end. But this. we could make different yeah. hypotheses and check them. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. We do rigorous testing. We uh, yeah, we start with the hypothesis, then we test and test and test, and then we come to conclusion. And several studies have shown that it usually takes several studies to show something. So yeah. <laughs> it's called meta-analyses. But, but that uh, would be a good publication, DNA or RNA, which one is yeah. better? <laughs> uh, how, about we, how about once we get into an R course and we know stuff about R, how about we write some sort of algorithm that would write the article for us? That is already done, like AI learning yeah. type of thing. No. There, there, there's actually this, this actually has been, I think, a publication two years yeah, ago. Yeah, 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 I think so. About too. an AI, which yeah. just uh, uh, created a scientific article about yeah, yeah. finding unicorns. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. If, if you want to read it, everyone just go out and, 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 and read it online. It's great. It's a great article. And it's just crazy to think that AI does that. So, yeah, uh, is, is it also the one, um, uh, I'm just thinking a bit further here, is it the one that got accepted in a high impact journal also? Uh, because there, there was, I think, an AI or some researchers that uh, for fun or testing the system, they wrote an article about a bullshit topic. Really? And it, got, it got accepted. It basically passed right through the peer review system and got accepted into publishing in a fairly high impact journal. I can't recall exactly which one, but I, I think there's a yeah. case of this. So also maybe look that up, um, could be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was also, the, I think a physics student in, in the United States who was just uh, having a few words, I think, for writing an article and he just used su suggested words afterwards. Okay. Okay. And he won some competition with that. Oh man. <laughs> so that's where we are. We we are talking about scientific creativity. I mean, probably in 10 years we don't need it anymore. We have AI. Yeah, that's true. The AI <laughs> will do it for us. Yeah. Okay. Clemens, I think this was a very lively interaction, a very fun interaction. Was fun. It was good to finally do this. We've been talking about this yeah. for some time now and we finally yeah. did it. Um, this will be on my channel. You can feature it then on your channel, of course so that people get more insights on you as a person. Um, and yeah, I hope we'll further collaborate in the future, of course. Yeah, right? of course, it'll be fun, yeah. So Clemens, right, so with that, I wish you a very good weekend. You too, thank you very much. It was fun, really. <laughs> yeah, and we'll see each other yeah. on YouTube, okay? Yeah. See you, buddy. Right. Bye. See ya. Cheers.